So I need to start off today's video uh, by apologizing to you um, because I yesterday I selfishly um, I didn't make a show because I went to the the hospital with my wife and uh, I chose to be there for her surgery rather than being there for the people that have always had my back and that's that's on me and I know some of you rightly are like how can we trust you you didn't you didn't start this video by hand holding it and then sitting on the on the floor you didn't start the show with a whisper so we had to up the volume how do we know you're sincere Phil and the truth is I you don't know and so I'm going you I'm going to try and show you with my actions what am I some fucking simp I have to I go to the hospital for my wife so she has emotional support what am I and scene well obviously I'm joking family comes first everyone knows that I am actually going to use this opportunity as a way to thank you show my love to you by announcing that for the month of April two people will be getting five thousand dollars Oh my God. One person for already having been subscribed to the channel, thank you for your loyalty, and one person who is newly subscribed in the month of April. Yeah, thank you, good luck, and welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Tuesday, April 6th, 2021. Hit that like button, otherwise I will punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. And to start off today's show, we'll talk about one of the most requested stories going into the weekend, and that was around Bad Baby. Right, rapper Bad Baby, who of course started as Catch Me Outside Girl, whose real name is Daniel Bregoli. She, just days after turning 18, joined OnlyFans, and wow, she showed that after just six hours after launch, she had already made over $1 million through a combination of subscriptions, tips, and direct messages, with several outlets also claiming to have confirmed the numbers with an OnlyFans rep. Which means not only was this a lot of money in a short amount of time, it was record setting. With the previous record having been set by Bella Thorne, who earned a million dollars in her first 24 hours. So it's big news for the platform, it is big news and big money for Bad Baby, but also secondarily, there was another story with this news, and that was that a lot of people were kind of weirded out. And this because, you know, there are all these stories in the news about 16 and 17 year olds kind of being preyed on by others, right? Of course, most recently you have the kind of wall of accusations we've seen against people like James Charles. Though that is obviously different because you have a famous adult talking to minors, but uh, still here you had a lot of people weirded out going, okay, wait. So there was just this huge group of people that were like drooling and waiting for this minor to turn legal. And while we don't know the number of individuals that were kind of just waiting and salivating for this to happen, uh, we do know that whatever that group size is, they had a million dollars in buying power in six hours. And yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird. Like I'm not gonna bash her, her getting her bag, everything that's happening right now, it is legal, but yeah. Uh, for those asking my opinion, as a as a 35 year old man, it's a it feels a little off because you know there were a ton of dudes waiting for her to turn 18, like they were watching the ball drop in New York, like 10, <laughs> 9, grab my wallet, 8, 7. But yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Then uh, a business celebrity story that kind of ties in. It's the the opposite of what we're seeing nowadays. Right, these days we're seeing more and more people that have established audiences going to places like OnlyFans. But on the opposite end, you have people like Kim Kardashian, who I mean, she became the big name that she was largely because of that that sex tape that came out. But you could argue more impressively, she was able to launch a career from that to the point where today we're seeing the news that she is now officially a billionaire. And Forbes saying that her stake in KKW Beauty is around 500 million, as well as her ownership in Skims being valued at 225 million. You know, you can say what you want about her, but it is it is genuinely impressive that she has had not only the staying power, but the ability to then grow and thrive. And, you know, I figured I'd share this story because I know so many of you, you as a collective group, have been rooting for her. Then, remember when we were talking about Amazon going on the offensive on social media? Or we saw official verified accounts like Amazon News responding to politicians who had been calling them out? With one of the most standout back and forths being with Representative Mark Pokin, who tweeted, Paying workers $15 an hour doesn't make you a progressive workplace when you union bust and make workers urinate in water bottles. To which, the official Amazon News account replied, You don't really believe the peeing in bottles thing, do you? If that were true, nobody would work for us. And that, as it turns out, age, it, it's, it's not even appropriate to say that it aged like milk, but something that's almost instant regret. It aged like a, a last call, 4 a.m., no protection used, one night stand. Almost immediately, we started seeing reports coming out with headlines like, documents show Amazon is aware drivers pee in bottles and even defecate en route despite company denial, as well as she wheeze in plastic bags. Amazon's pee scandal is much worse for women. And now, over the past several days, resulted in other headlines like, Amazon admits drivers sometimes 
sometimes have to pee in bottles while on the job, as well as headlines that revealed it and stories that show that Amazon has since apologized. Though, they did that thing that sometimes people do when they apologize, they, they attach other people. They're like, it's not just me being shitty. With them linking to several articles about Uber, taxi, and UPS drivers suffering the same problem. And then, after spreading the blame, trying to put targets on other companies' backs, uh, they say, we are gonna fix the problem. Writing in a statement, regardless of the fact that this is industry-wide, we would like to solve it. Don't do that, Amazon. You're not the hero in this story. You are a company not treating your employees with dignity and respect. You don't somehow become absolved of that after you got called out, your lie and your bluff got called out, and other people also happen to be guilty of not treating human beings like human beings. You need to take and own your L, eat a bowl and shut the fuck up, and stop acting like you're the good guy, that you deserve some award because you acknowledge the thing that everyone else pointed out to you. Anyway, that, that's where I'll end the story for now. Then, in it's huge news, but it stopped feeling like huge news five scandals ago, the news broke over the weekend that the information for over half a billion Facebook users has been leaked online. As far as what the information includes, it's things like phone numbers, Facebook IDs, full names, locations, birthdays, bios, email addresses. As far as how widespread this is, reportedly it affects users in 100 six countries, including the United States with 32 million users, the UK with 11 million, and India with 6 million. The leaked data set is reportedly from 2019, and uh, that still may actually be a problem despite being now a couple years old. Or there's still a major concern that cyber criminals could access this information to impersonate other people or even scam them into handing over their login credentials. In fact, the leaked data was first discovered back in January when a user on a low-level hacking forum offered to sell the info as part of an automated bot. Though, what ended up happening is on Saturday, someone leaked that information for free. And for those that would like to see if you've been affected by this leak, there are actually a couple of ways to do so. For example, you've got web security consultant Troy Hunt uploading affected email addresses to haveibeenpwned.com. I'll link to the site down below. He's also since uploaded affected phone numbers, and while there are other sites that are offering these kinds of searches, uh, they're less well known. So for that reason, I'm not going to be linking to those personally. Then, we should definitely talk about movie theaters feeling a little bit of hope in this, thanks to Godzilla vs. Kong. Because, unlike pretty much every movie that's been released over the past year, it did not completely bomb. Domestically, it made $48.5 million during the long Easter weekend opening between Wednesday and Sunday, which is absolutely massive because the previous record over the last year was Wonder Woman 1984, which brought in just $16.7 million during the holiday season. You know, one of the standout things with Godzilla vs. Kong is that it actually rivaled the domestic opening weekend of its predecessor. That was in 2019 when you had theaters fully open at full capacity. Right now, they're at you know, 25 to 50%. And this is happening at a time where Godzilla vs. Kong isn't even exclusive in theaters. It can be streamed right now on HBO Max at no additional cost. So a lot of analysts right now think that this means that theaters have the potential to just come back strong. With B. Riley Securities analyst Eric Wold writing that this theatrical performance destroys lingering concerns around theatrical window importance and demonstrates a solid path to resurgence. And adding that this is a clear indication that consumers want to return to theaters even with the onslaught of streaming options reaching home. This is also stirred up debate, is this a bad idea to have this hybrid model to, to allow people to go to theaters or watch from home. Personally, you know, I'll say regarding that conversation, I, I would love to have the hybrid model. There are gonna be some movies like Godzilla vs. Kong that are, it's just gonna be a better experience in a movie theater. It's a turn off your brain, CGI action spectacular, yes. Big visual, big sound, big reactions from the audience. But at the same time, just having the ability to stream something is amazing. As you know, going into 2022, 2023, I, I do wonder what the theatrical and what the on-demand window will look like. I mean, you already have Disney and Disney Plus normalizing not only are you a subscriber, but you pay a premium for, for same-day release movies. But because Disney's not releasing those numbers, we don't know how big of a success or big of a failure it is. Though, I will say, whatever they decide, they're gonna, they're gonna have me as a subscriber for a long time. Did you see that Loki trailer? Yes, please. Thank you. But from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Olipop. Olipop is a brand new soda that looks and tastes exactly like your favorite childhood sodas, but without all the processed sugar and artificial ingredients. Like Olipop actually tastes like the real thing, but has less than 5% of the sugar and net carbs of the sodas we all grew up on. And it's also got one third of your daily fiber intake, which makes it the only soda that I know of that is good for your gut. Olipop is also gluten-free, vegan, paleo-friendly, and only 35 calories. Basically, it'll satisfy your sweet tooth and curb that soda addiction all in one. The variety 12 pack includes root beer, strawberry, vanilla, vanilla, cherry vanilla, ginger lemon, vintage cola, and orange squeeze. So if you love classic root beer or Stewart's orange cream soda as a kid, I I'm telling you, Olipop really is just like the real thing. Though I, I will say cherry vanilla has become my go-to. But fantastically with all of this right now, they are offering you beautiful bastards a deal you can't even find in stores. You'll get 15% off their best-selling variety 12 pack plus 
free shipping right now if you go to drinkolipop.com slash Franco and be sure to use code DeFranco at checkout. Then in COVID news, we have President Biden today expected to announce that all American adults who want the COVID-19 vaccine can get it as of April 19th instead of the previous deadline of May 1st. And this opening up of access appears to be connected to the kind of overall success of the rollout because yes, while there have been speed bumps, just now 75 days after his inauguration, over 150 million doses have been administered. And that's huge. Of course, he initially wanted 100 million shots in the first 100 days. He has since doubled that goal and appears to be on track to get 200 million shots by his 100th day. Though I will say to a certain degree, this is a largely symbolic move. You know, I say that because many states have actually already moved up their original goal dates. I mean, just yesterday alone, at least a dozen states opened it up to anyone over 16 and only a couple of states still have the May 1st deadline. And then let's talk about Georgia, voting laws, corporate America, and the all-star game. So as we've talked about on the show before, Georgia has now changed their voting laws and there's been a lot of backlash. I'll of course link to the full law down below in case you're interested in reading 98 pages or you know, scrubbing through them. But just some of the key changes include new ID requirements for absentee voters, shortened absentee voting. Instead of 49 days, absentee ballots have to be sent out 29 days before an election. Guaranteed, but notably limited drop boxes. Right, so each county must have at least one absentee drop box, but the law limits how many boxes each county can have, how long they can be open and where they can be located. And of course, the just very odd thing that it is now a misdemeanor to hand out what they refer to as money or gifts, including directly handing out snacks and water to people while they're standing in line to vote. And according to reports, while GOP lawmakers say that the law is necessary to restore confidence in Georgia's elections, you have Democrats saying that it'll restrict voting access for underrepresented voters, especially people of color. Right, one of the big things we've seen with the story is corporate America actually taking a stand. Where you have tons of executives at these massive companies speaking out, uh, companies like Apple, Microsoft, American Express, Patagonia comparing the laws to Jim Crow, uh, Georgia operated Delta and Coca-Cola speaking out, which has led to GOP politicians boycotting these companies in return and even threatening their tax breaks in some cases. One of the latest and biggest things is that Major League Baseball announced that they are moving the All-Star game out of Georgia, with the news that the MLB is moving the game to Colorado, which has now just become this whole other story because you have places like Fox News saying MLB picks Colorado over Georgia despite similar voting law, which at minimum is a short-sighted misunderstanding of the whole situation or uh, an outright lie. Right, Colorado does have a voter ID law. Colorado has only about two weeks of early voting. One, if you actually look at the voter ID laws, Colorado's is way less strict than Georgia's. Two, it is accurate that the number of in-person voting days in Colorado is less than Georgia, but that may also be because Colorado has universal mail-in voting. It's so accessible and easy there. I think in 2020, 94% of voters voted by mail. They also have same day registration. And hey, guess what? When you put all these things together, it's no wonder that the state ranked number two in turnout in 2020, which may or may not be, may be the reason that Georgia Republican politicians are trying to suppress voter turnout. Because once again, all these attempts to change voter laws in all these states, including Georgia, they're based on a lie. The election was secure, safe, and legitimate. This is something that even Bill Barr said, he, he arguably one of Trump's biggest lapdogs. And understand, I, I say this not as a way to reason with or try and get people to see the light. Like this was a terrifying one to me. According to a new Reuters Ipsos poll, about half of Republicans believe that the attack on the Capitol was actually a nonviolent protest or was actually the handiwork of left-wing activists trying to make Trump look bad. Right, so if half of that group is that far gone and the other half, I guess, would still willingly vote for a group that supports that or, or kind of pushes this, this bullshit, it's more, I guess, for the independents or for people that are left-leaning to not <laughs> forget the world that we're living just because every single moment it doesn't feel like we're gonna die. And also, I guess, because truth should matter. But yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts on this story and because uh, that's the where I'm gonna end it. <laughs> And then let's definitely talk about a major update coming from the ongoing trial of former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin. And that's because yesterday we saw Minneapolis police chief Madaria Arradondo giving a shocking testimony against Chauvin. Right, so this would be a huge deal on its own because it's already rare for a police chief to take the witness stand against a fellow police officer. But it was also an even bigger deal because of what he specifically said about Chauvin in his testimony. Do you believe that the defendant followed dep departmental policy 5-304 regarding de-escalation. I absolutely do not agree with that. When the lawyer showed a picture of Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck and asked if this was part of the department's training on defensive tactics or departmental policy on neck restraints, the chief said no and added, The conscious neck restraint by policy mentions light to moderate pressure. When I look at Exhibit 17, 
Um, and when I look at the facial expression of, of, of Mr. Floyd, that does not appear in any way, shape, or form that that is light to moderate pressure. So is it your belief then that this particular uh, form of restraint, if that's what you, if that's what we'll call it, uh, uh, in fact, violates departmental policy? I absolutely agree that violates our policy. But I'm also going on to know that in order for use of force to be considered reasonable, it has to be applied throughout the entire encounter and that a number of factors have to be taken into account, including the threat to officers and others and adding. There's, there's an initial reasonableness in trying to just get him under control over the, in the first few seconds. But, but uh, once there was no longer any resistance and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive and even motionless to continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that uh, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. Also, when asked if he thought Floyd showed signs of medical distress, the chief said yes. Also, noting that he didn't see any of the other officers providing first aid after they were unable to find a pulse. I, I agree that uh, the defendant violated our policy in terms of rendering aid. Right, and all of this, in addition to being highly unusual, this testimony is massively significant for two reasons. First of all, the chief is now the highest ranking public safety officer to testify against Chauvin. Secondly, as the New York Times points out, his testimony underscored the difficulty that Mr. Chauvin and his lawyers will have in persuading the jury that the officer was just doing his job when he pinned Mr. Floyd to the ground with his knee for more than nine minutes last May. In my opinion, that is spot on because Chauvin's defense attorneys have focused on this claim that the police department's policies give officers some room. Right. So some room to determine the reasonableness of the use of force case by case, which the chief did agree with. But as seen in those clips, the chief also emphasized that Chauvin violated department policies on a number of things in addition to reasonable force. Right, things including neck restraints, nonviolent de-escalation, and rendering medical aid. Right, so ultimately it just furthers the argument that he wasn't acting in accordance with a number of police policies. But uh, of course this is just one day, one testimony, and we're gonna have to wait and see what happens with this trial. And ultimately with this story or really anything that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because this is the end of the video. As always on these daily videos, thanks for watching, subscribe and like and all the good stuff. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.